ladies and gentlemen. May I have your kind attention, please? We are about to start now. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The Honorable Vice Rector of Partnership and Planning Open of Universitas Sebelas Maret, Professor Dr. Renat Sandida. The Honorable Dean of Faculty of Entrepreneurship and Education, Universitas Sebelas Maret, Dr. Martiana MSc. The Honorable Speaker of Webinar, Professor Van Hulingan. Good morning, Professor Hulingan. The Honorable Speaker of Webinar, Professor of Minsuha. Good afternoon, Professor. And the Honorable Speakers of Webinar, Dr. Sawanto. Good afternoon, Dr. Sawanto. The Honorable Head of Science Education Department, Dr. Pat Turma Yugita Indriani, SPD, MSC, MSC. The Respectable Lecturer of Science Education Department of Universitas Sebelas Maret. And all of the audience, once again, good, good afternoon. afternoon. My name is Meta Aulia. And my name is Afsanul Dakwin. On the behalf of the Science Education Department, Faculty of Teacher Training and Education, University of Las Maras, we are prepared to have you all here today. And also, we are very pleased to be the MC in this international webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the international webinar entitled Science Education for Society 5.0. That is held by the Department of Science Education, Faculty of Teacher Training and Education, Universitas Sebelas Maret, Surakarta. This webinar is held on Wednesday, 28 October 2020 at 1 p.m. Jakarta time. It's also the day of National Youth Pledge Day. On a special afternoon, we have several agendas followed. The first agenda will be singing Indonesia National Anthem. The second agenda will be speech from head of science education department of Universitas Blas Maret. The third agenda will be speech from vice rector on planning and partnership of Universitas Blas Maret. The fourth agenda will be main lecture from our speakers. The first speaker will be Professor Juan Kulingan from Utrecht University. The second speaker will be Professor Min Suha from Kangwon University. Followed by our third speaker, Dr. Samantha from Universitas Blas Maret. And the fifth agenda will be presentation certificate of appreciation for speakers. And as the final agenda, we have closing. Ladies and gentlemen, the first agenda will be singing the national anthem of Indonesia. So please make yourself ready and we will sing Indonesia Raya. For the second agenda, I would like to call the Head of Science Education Department of Universitas Sebelas Maret to give an opening speech to Mrs. Nurma Yunita. The time is yours. Thank you. 
Ya. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good, good afternoon everybody and good morning for Professor Hollingen, the Honorable Vice Rector for Partnership and Planning Affairs, Professor Dr. Renar Sajidan MSI. Good afternoon, Prof. And good afternoon, Dean, Faculty of Teacher Training and Education, Dr. Mardiana MSI. And the Honorable Vice Dean for Academic Affairs, Faculty of Teacher Training and Education, Professor Selamat Subiantoro MSC. And all of three speakers, the first is Professor Wajah Jolingen, Utrecht University, Netherlands, Professor Min Suha, PhD from Kangwon National University, South Korea. And of course, uh, our colleague here, Dr. Sarwanto from Universitas Plas Maret. Of course, our lecturers and committee from Science Education Department, distinguished guests, participant of the webinar. Alhamdulillah, today in celebration of National Youth Pledge Day, we gather in this academic forum to learn and gain uh, knowledge from the expert. We have the expert today. And this pandemic is a big challenge for education. We should adapt with innovation and science creativity toward a society 5.0. Uh, as the department, our department is the youngest department in our faculty, have a mission to graduate uh, high qualified science teachers that of course contribute to the innovation of the world in science education. Uh, thanks to all speakers, committee, participants, and our vice rector, Dean, vice dean. And we would like to ask Professor Sajidan to give opening remarks after this agenda and open this event officially. We do hope uh, the webinar could expand our knowledge and of course the partnership between Universitas Plas Marat, Kangwon National University, Utrecht University could go further. It's a joint research and publication, of course. We look forward to meeting you in person soon. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Mrs. Norma Yunita, the Head of Science Education Department of Universitas Universitas Plasmada for your delightful opening speech. Now for the third agenda, I would like to call Vice Vice Talk for Partnership and Planning of Press of Universitas of Plasmada to give an opening speech and as a remark to open this webinar officially. Mr. Sajidan, the time is yours. Time for me? Yes. I'm sorry, I have problem with electricity in uh, my house, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh... Yeah, we can give you some Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Okay, Honorable uh, Dean and Vice Dean of Teacher Training and Education Faculty of uh, Universitas Plas Maret, also Honorable Professor Minsu Ha uh, from uh, Kangwon National University, and also Professor uh, Van Jolingen from Utrecht University, Netherlands, I think so, and Pak Dr. Sarwanto from Universitas Plas Maret. And all participants in the workshop. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon and good morning for the speaker and participants. On behalf of uh, Nufritas Plus Marat, uh, I thank uh, very much uh, the three speakers from their willingness to share some insight uh, in the international webinar on science education of for society 5.0. Uh, I would also like to thank the participant for you into, into, uh, into, uh, into Seosium uh, to, uh, to participate in this event. Uh, I would li also like to thank the Department of uh, Science Education of the Faculty of Teacher Training and Education, Universitas Plas Marat, for organizing this event. As we have known, 
uh, the new era of society, which uh, in, is a society 5.0, uh, has been initiated uh, since last year. It is a concept uh, that inspires uh, us that technological ad, uh, advancement, yeah, advancements uh, should make human more comfortable in which people uh, should process uh, and control technology. Uh, this presence uh, of industrial revolution 4.0 with all sorts of dis disruptions uh, should be appropriately managed. Yeah, in this uh, in the education sector, the society 5.0 uh, is also expected to bring a comfortable environment for learning in the digital era. Therefore, uh, this international webinar today uh, is important for uh, to provide a comprehensive understanding with regard to science education in the society 5.0. Uh, this event is also in line with the vision in our university to be a world-class university. Yeah, Universitas Plus Marat has committed to contribute uh, in the sustainable development, not only at the national level, but also in the regional uh, and international environment. Uh, as we are fully aware that in today's globalis uh, globalized, yeah, uh, globalized uh, world, yeah, contribution in universities should uh, be promoted uh, to a wider spectrum. Finally, uh, let me reiterate uh, that we strongly expect that this forum will be beneficial for you all and again. We thanks uh, very much. Uh, for participating in this webinar. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you to Mr. Sajidan as Vice Rector for Partnership and Planning Affairs of Universitas 11 Maret for your delightful opening speech. Ladies and gentlemen, now we are moving to our main agenda for today's webinar. For today's webinar, we have some rules to obey during the main agenda. The first rule is, speakers and participants of the meeting should mute themselves unless they are speaking. Attendees are by default mute during the webinar and just the host and session chair can unmute them during q and a. Second rule is, for the webinars, the attendees can submit questions at the end of each talk using the race and feature in Zoom. The third rule is, attendees and participants should first mention their name before asking their question when unmute. The fourth rule is, attendees can post questions in the chat box, but only if they cannot use the race and feature to announce the environment or for another reason. Ladies and gentlemen, this webinar will be given by three speakers and will, and will be moderated by Ms. Vivian in Sarwenda Asri Nograheni, MPD. Before we begin our main agenda, please allow us to read our moderator profile. Ms. Vivian Sarwenda Asri Nograheni is one of our lecturers in Science Education Department. Faculty of Teacher Training and Education, Universitas Sebelas Barat. The area that says expertise is science education. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, because we know how enthusiastic we are for listening to the lecture that will be given by our speakers. Let's begin the webinar. To Ms. Armenda, the time is yours. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for Ms. Meta. Now we will start the main session before introducing our speakers today. We know that our webinar theme is Science Education for, for Society 5.0. Why Society 5.0? As we know, goal of Society 5.0 is to create a human-centric society in which both economic development and the resolution of social challenges are achieved and people can enjoy a high quality of life that is fully achieved and comfortable. How can we achieve it? 
of course through education that's why we need to learn about it today okay let me introduce our first speaker uh, his name is professor Walter Rinder van Julingen he is uh, from Utrecht University from Pruden Prudental Institute, Netherlands, area of expertise is digital learning, learning by modeling, physic and inquiry learning. And Professor Yulingen, time is yours for 45 minutes for presentation and 15 minutes for Q&A better. Please. Okay, thank you, Ferriari, for introducing me. Um, <coughs> And then like, uh, like you said, I'm a professor of science and mathematics education at the Freudenthal Institute. Do you all hear me? Yeah, yes, yeah I, I hear so. you. Yeah. And I'm, uh, for me, it's quite early in the morning. Uh, so um, we still have the lights on and, and it's dark outside. Um, but uh, I'm very honored to, to be invited as a speaker to this, uh, to this webinar. And I will try to do my best to uh, uh, to provide you with some insights on our work based mainly on system thinking and modeling. And though you announced me as being uh, having a background in physics, which is true, I will be talking mainly about uh, biology today. But I will now share my presentation with you, and I think you will be able to see this. Um, I will talk about how we can advance in science education. And I will also touch there on, uh, on lesson study. And that's why I chose the lesson study NL template as a background for this, because it's a partnership of seven institutes and universities in the Netherlands. Uh, they are of which Utrecht University and, and specifically the Fredital Institute is one. And basically I will talk about two studies that were done by, uh, by PhD students uh, uh, of mine who are currently investigating how they can improve science education and they use lesson study in, in doing that. So that will be the, the main feature of my, uh, my talk. And I like to start with a question that has been bothering me or that, that actually is some thing that, we, that I'm concerned with all the time, um, basically, what can we know about science education at all? Um, we quite often see in literature that we have studies where two groups are compared to each other and one group does better. And then we say, hooray, um, we know something more. But if you really look at the practice of teaching, it's very hard to get that knowledge into the teaching practice. And sometimes also we find things that may be true in a kind of very controlled laboratory setting, but are not really useful for, for practice the practice of education. So one of my main goals in science education, in educational research is to be strongly linked to the educational practice, to always work with teachers and in, uh, in schools really as part of the, the, the daily practice of, of science lessons, rather than uh, being uh, very theoretical and having uh, mm -hmm. approaches that really don't relate to, uh, to practice directly. So that is basically setting my, uh, my stance and my view on how we should do research. And that's also at some point where lesson study comes in. But before doing that, I'd like to talk a bit about the why of science education. Why are we teaching science at all? And why do we think it's important that all people, all students learn about science? And if you think about science education, I think many people will recognize the left-hand side of this slide. Um, we teach science quite often as science uh, and I, symbolize that with a blackboard full of formulas um, where, um, where we're teaching the theory of science, but we teach it in, in, inside the science itself. We don't really link it to, to, to society. And if you let, look to the picture on the, on the right side, um, you see that science 
usually has a big impact in society. Um, the, by the way, the fact that we are able to have this webinar is uh, due to a lot of scientific insights that all combine in being able to communicate on a distance. I'm here in Utrecht, you are in, uh, in Indonesia, uh, about, I think, 9,000 kilometers apart. Um, and the only thing that really makes a difference is the time of the day. Um, you, we, we could be talking uh, uh, in, in separate rooms uh, next to each other as, as well. So science has a lot of things to offer to society, but we also see that there is some kind of uh, sometimes a fear of science, denial of scientific knowledge. You only have to look to the American president um, in, in how he treats sci uh, science and, and people follow that. And uh, there is a mistrust in, in science. Well, the picture shows a very optimistic solution. Science is, an, is a solution for all. I don't think that's true either. I think there is always a strong link between science and, and society. And if we are teaching science, we need to be aware of that. So that leads to new needs for science education. We see on the, on the, on the one hand, we see all kinds of developments, both in society, we see the available of new technologies, uh, both for teaching science, but also te new technologies that influence our lives. Uh, and that goes at a, at a very rapid pace nowadays. Uh, I like the fact that you already had your version number 5.0 for society. I think in, here we are only talking about 3.0 if we are talking about version numbers. Uh, but of course, it's quite arbitrary. And uh, and also, we, of course, we are doing uh, research on science education. So also that leads to new, uh, new insights. Um, and those developments also lead to new goals for scientific education, new methods, and also maybe new perspectives on science that we too, should incorporate in our teaching. So if you look at societal developments, we see that we are now living in, a, in an information society. Information is at our fingertips, which is a beauty, but also something uh, that we need people to, to know how to deal with all that information. Um, we see that professions are changing. We have huge uh, challenges ahead in climate change and environment. Uh, we have a big pandemic. Um, and, but we, at the same time, we see that people don't trust science anymore. What I was uh, saying earlier, um, we don't, we see that when, when, uh, people are denying climate change, even denying uh, the spread of the virus, uh, seeing conspiracies everywhere. And I think that's something as science educators, we have a big task mm -hmm. in, um, in fighting those trends, in educating people, in uh, having not only a trust in science, but mainly a very realistic view on what science can do or and not. Science is not, not the solution for everything, but science does have a valuable contribution. And we quite often see this, and, and I know that term is a bit, um, uh, already a bit old. We are uh, already on one fifth of the 21st century, uh, but we need what we call 21st century skills for that. So a new goal in science education would be um, what you can call scientific literacy with a focus on what does science, how does it work? What is this role of science in my life? And what can be my role in science? Because also we need people who are scientifically educated to play a role in, um, in, the, in further developments in science. And that leads again to insights within the science education. Um, if you look at how we see science education, that has changed over the, uh, over the last few decades. Um, I think if you were looking at the 80s, 90s of the previous century, I think most people saw science education mainly as a preparation for further education in science, especially mathematics education was seen that way. You need mathematics as a tool to be able to, uh, to, to study something. Still true. But it is more. It is also true that even a person with a language profile or a, um, 
uh, so with a non-natural uh, science profile who leaves high school should have at least some basic understanding on how science works and what science means for uh, for society and for his personal life. So that he has the, 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 the thinking tools, for instance, to be able to decide whether um, to go for a vaccine or what what his or her role can be in uh, in preventing and stopping climate change. And so that means that the goals of science education are shifting from facts and skills more to science in the context of society, which also means learning about science, not only learning the, the results of science, not only, uh, in, for instance, in physics, learning about uh, Newton's laws and the way you, you can apply them, but also how they those laws come about, uh, what is the role of models and system thinking in, in science, some basic knowledge about the philosophy of, of science. So to have some view on science um, and knowing how science comes about, because I think that's really part of an important part of such a view. So what I will do is I will present two examples of research that we're doing, uh, one about systems thinking and one about learning with and about models. Uh, and they are part of research PhD projects of two of my uh, PhD students, Mel de Gillissen on the left and Susanne Janssen on the right. And in the middle is Christine Knippels because she, she's the co-supervisor of both PhD projects. So I'm always stressing that whenever I do research, we do research, it's always in a team. And, and, and so this is basically the, uh, a kind of team uh, and, and involved, involved in teaching about science and especially in biology. Christine Knippels is a uh, associate professor in uh, biology education. And, uh, and both Melde and Susanna are not only researchers in science education, but they're also teachers. Uh, and I think that's important also to notice. So they have a part-time job as teachers of biology in two different schools and a part-time job as a PC student and researcher. And they both are in biology. So I'm, as a physicist, I will talk some biology right now. Um, and one of the things I really like about being a professor in science education that you can learn a lot about the uh, parts of science that, uh, that are not really your, 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 your specialty. My background is in quantum mechanics. And now I also know a lot about chemistry and biology. And I really enjoy learning that because you see that um, the way of thinking in the, the various sciences varies a bit, but there were also many similarities. So you really get some view on how, uh, how the thinking and the development of the various sciences uh, occurs. So biology and biology, as you all know, is a very, very complex topic. I think of all, um, I always say that physicists do a uh, very complex thing, um, reasoning about very simple things about one or two particle systems. In biology, you have to simplify the very complex things to understand at least something. Um, and uh, biology is, uh, of course, the, the, the whole science of life and evolution is a very, um, very complex matter. Uh, so the, the view on the, on the world is, is really different there. And one thing that biologists do in, um, in trying to grasp the, uh, the complexity of their domain is to organize things in levels, to, or to have some levels of biological uh, organizations. So at the very bottom level, they look at molecules, that complex molecules that interact to, to sustain the processes of life. Then you look to... Um, to cells, tissues, the tissues uh, combine to organs, the organs has, have organ systems, and then you have an organism. And even above that, you have organizations like um, populations and ecosystems. So that's the way of organizing uh, the complexity of, of biology, and it works for plants, for animals, for, and for, uh, for basically for all biological systems you can use that, those organization levels to try to understand it. So if you want to understand why at some point um, 
a, a horse gets sick, they're sick to the horses. You can look at the organ systems of the horse. You can see where there are things going wrong. And maybe you end up at the cell level. And what you have to do um, to really understand the, understand the system in, in biology is to, um, to go up and down uh, those levels of organization. So at some point you have to see you, there's something you don't under, a process you don't understand. You dive into it. You see the heart um, that has an important function in the bloodstream. You analyze that and you can go up again to your whole blood system to understand how that works. And that's uh, um, um, Christine Knippels uh, calls it yo-yoing, uh, uh, just a, the toy that goes up and down. Now here they are drawn horizontally, but that, that's the basic idea. In order to understand some uh, a biologic, biological system, you always have to introduce more than one layer in your, in your understanding, and you have to be able to, to switch between that. And that brings us to systems thinking, because this yo-yoing, the hierarchy of systems, is one aspect of the way of thinking about biological systems. Um, if and system thinking is an approach that biologists apply to all to really every level of complexity in in, in biology. Uh, so for instance, on the picture here is a cell, and we see the cell as a system. And that means that we uh, that we see that the cell has a boundary. Some things come in, and some things go out. And in the case of the cell, that is very literally um, the molecules that can pass the cell boundary. And uh, but within the cell, we have subsystems. We have the mitochondria. We have the the nucleus, uh, the DNA within the nucleus. So we have subsystems in the cell. But again, at the same time, the cell is part of a larger system, like a tissue. And the tissue is, again, part of the organ. So we can, uh, for the cell, we can say it has a boundary. It has several components. Uh, it interacts with other cells. But and there are interactions between the components in the cell. There are things going in and out, the input and the output. And there is a hierarchy, like I said, the component, the cell has components, the components have subcomponents, etc. Um, there are processes in the cell that keep the cell in, in, a, in a state of uh, equilibrium, uh, and that's, that's called, usually called feedback. So, for instance, if the concentration of a certain uh, molecule becomes too high in the cell, the cell will take measures to uh, to reduce that concentration again. And um, all that combines to what we can call dynamics. Uh, a cell is not a static unit that just sits there. Um, every cell in, in, a, in a biological system, in, a, in an organ, uh, has a function and, is, uh, and shows dynamics. And of course, it depends very much on the type of cell, what it does. For instance, a, a blood cell will take an oxygen, move to the place where the oxygen is needed and give, give off the oxygen again. And well, for every other cell, you can uh, think how that works. But important in system thinking is that we can use cells uh, as an example system. But for every biological system, we can analyze it in the same seven um, uh, components. And what we see in biology education is that teachers um, don't often teach system thinking explicitly. Um, we see it as important. Uh, they see it as important. But if you look at the biological textbooks, if you look at um, typical lessons, and, and the, the prior research of Melde also showed that, showed that, is that teachers see the need but they don't know how they can really uh, emphasize system thinking in their biology lessons. So the goal of Melda's research process is to devise methods and guidelines and heuristics to help teachers, to support teachers in teaching system thinking. And what she does, there's my microphone on right now and making noise. Maybe that person can mute himself. Um, one, um, one thing about, um, 
lesson study uh, about the research she does is she uses lesson study. And she uses that for, for various reasons. One is um, she didn't want to sit behind a desk and develop a, uh, a method and then go teach her and say, try it out. Because there, there, there are some, several problems with that. Um, one is that the teachers may have their own personal styles of teaching. Um, they may have, um, uh, they, they may not be as knowledgeable as the researcher to um, uh, about system thinking to teach. Um, so what what Melda wanted to do is to stress the uh, ownership of the teachers of the, the heuristics she developed. And in um, in lesson study, you form a team of teachers who together will develop a lesson and then design it, um, teach it, observe it, uh, especially have an observation to individual students in the classroom and see how they learn and then evaluate the lesson, adjust it, uh, and then use that information to maybe think again about the aim of the lesson, but also lead to, uh, to new lessons uh, as follow up. So, um, and it, it provides a real wealth of data that you can use also for analyzing whether a lesson uh, um, works out as you plan. Uh, there is a lot of data in the preparation of the lesson. So we know the reasons why certain actions take place in the lesson, why, uh, um, why the lesson was designed as it is. Um, there's data from the lesson itself. We, we record all the lessons on video. There are students' products in the lesson. Um, and after the lesson, we interview the teacher, the, the students. So we have this whole cycle of, of lesson study as our main instrument for developing it. And one thing, and it's a quote on the bottom of the, the slide, is that um, teachers really like it. They say, OK, I now really understand how system, what system thinking is, and that helps me in my teaching. And that's, uh, I think, a big bonus compared to um, yeah, compared to the um, uh, to when we would de de design a, say a kind of ideal lesson. So in the end Melde developed four lessons. Uh, lesson one was about getting to know the system characteristic, introducing basically the language about system thinking that students uh, that students need in oh, in uh, the second lesson, um, she introduced a new system, the regulation of glucose in the blood. Um, and she asked students to apply, uh, apply system characteristics to learning this new system. In the third and the fourth lesson, she uh, introduced more complex system and introduced a system model, basically a tool set for understanding, uh, for modeling the, uh, the the, the more complex system. And in the final lesson, um, she, you, uh, she taught students how to learn that, uh, that model in visualizing and understanding the hierarchy and system characteristics. I will mainly focus on the first two lessons. And in the first lesson, the goal basically was understand what a system is and, and how we have those seven system characteristics. And what she did is she uh, started about thinking about a school, because a school is also a system. There are teachers, students, there are lessons, rooms. So a school has lots of components. There's also all kinds of dynamics uh, going on in a school. Uh, uh, there is a hierarchy um, in terms of uh, the school as a whole, the individual classes, the, um, uh, the, 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 the sections of teachers, and of course, also the individual students in the school. So you, you use that for the children, for the students to really talk, learn to talk about systems and to learn the system language in those seven hierarchies. And one thing she de de designed for that, and that's actually now part of a package that we are distributing to schools, um, was a, a ten gram game. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but you, but you can use those seven figures to to lay out many different kinds of figures, 
uh, of shapes and using that, that and of course it's very nice that the traditional game has seven uh, pieces so we can use it also to uh, to link them to seven characteristics and every part of the um, uh, every system characteristic was uh, represented by an icon um, and I leave it as an exercise to you to see which icon stands for which um, uh, which system characteristics and um, those icons were used as a, as a trigger and uh, to, for the system characteristics and after the lesson um, she had made posters uh, using the tangra, uh, tangram in different shapes and she um, and they were in the classroom all the time so ch children were really reminded about system thinking all the time in also in the the, the following lessons then after introducing them, she asked students to, um, to apply the question to a biological context, the cell. And then uh, they were asked to, to repeat and, and name the characteristics. So it was, it was basically a lesson introducing the seven system characteristics. In the second lesson, and you see the, uh, well, the people, students with a bit strange heads, they are uh, blocked for reasons of anonymity. Um, she linked uh, the, the glucose regulation of blood in, in, in blood in a kind of role play. And in each group, each student played a role like I'm the, uh, the one, uh, I play the insulin, I play the glucagon. So the two uh, hormones that regulate the, the glucose production. There was one note taker, one graph uh, uh, who, who, who just created the graph like in the bottom. So, and they, they really played out what would happen uh, in the morning when you wake up and then you have breakfast with, with some sweets maybe, then um, and the glucagon kicks in to, uh, to make sure that the, uh, the glucose doesn't get uh, too high, um, etc. And the, the, the goal was uh, try to keep the glucose level between uh, specific levels, four and eight uh, millimole per liter, in order to uh, make sure that you have energy, but you are, uh, uh, but there's not too much glucose, which also can damage, of course, do damage. So this is how um, uh, how they how they played it out. So they really formed a system themselves and realized what came in and what came out be because they. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the events was, uh, well, was eating something sweet, for instance, and see how the various system components needed to react to that. Then in lessons three and four, she used this uh, very schematic view that could be applied to all systems. So you see the arrows representing in and output, um, the, the components, the relation between the components, and the dynamics were represented by Okay, suppose something comes in, what will happen in those components? And then you, they, they actually were made aware that sometimes they, uh, a component uh, to, um, to understand how that component would behave would, uh, would need to be decomposed in further components. So, um, uh, so they needed to switch between levels here. So what came out of that? Uh, in the first lesson, um, they really just took took in the, the components uh, and really needed the, the icons as a reminder of what the components would be. So the, the, the icons really had a, uh, had a role there. And in the end, uh, students um, in, the, in the questionnaire, the, the, the worksheet they had at the end, they, most students were able with the help of the icons to, to name all the seven characteristics and provide proper description. Most could, uh, could properly describe four out of the seven. And we saw that there were difficulties in understanding what really what hierarchy, feedback, and dynamics really really mean. Part of that was probably due to the, uh, to the example system of the school that we uh, used, because hierarchy indeed can mean two things. A hierarchy can be 
someone who's placed higher in the organization, uh, like uh, the, the head of school is higher than um, the head of a, of a department who's higher than a teacher. But that's actually slightly different kind of hierarchy than is meant in system thinking. Same with feedback and dynamics. Uh, the, the, the understanding of those three was not really um, what could improve. And that's why basically also why we introduced the, the, the second lesson where those things like feedback and especially the feedback and dynamics uh, played an important role. And after that, they were able to, uh, to link those terms to dynamic behavior in biology system they already knew. And um, what would be interesting to know also is that uh, at, the, at the end of the second lesson, students still didn't really see why they were learning system thinking. Uh, they were thinking quite a bit in, in grades, um, but they didn't completely make the click and see how that could help them to understand biological systems. Uh, at least some of the students uh, did that, uh, others already started to show the seeded needs. Um, and for that, I think the, the lessons three and four became very important. Here you see one way of the, 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 the children filled it in. Um, so this is about a, a water system with pla uh, water plants, uh, things coming in, what's in the system uh, and what goes out again. And um, what you can see is that they were able, capable, you, of course, it's in Dutch, I'm sorry, you can't read it, but what you see that they identified components such as water and, and seagrass, but also in using the yellow color, uh, the, the internal relations, and they could then link it to, to other levels as well. And follow, following this lessons, they were asked to use this approach also to exam questions. And then they started to see, okay, it re can really help me to, in a simple way, understand the exam questions. And our goal uh, indeed was to, um, to show how, uh, how this way of thinking helps you and helps biologists to understand co complex organizations and taking it again back to the level of science and society. I think learning this kind, this way of thinking help students to understand the role of biology and, and the way biological knowledge will develop. So in the end, they said something like, with this approach, you're thinking deeper about the questions, you're able to give a better answer from different perspectives. And that's, of course, exactly the thing we want to see. Um, of course, we, uh, we can be very optimistic about that. So, um, uh, and we, we always, in cases like this, you, you reach a number of students, but not all. So uh, for teachers, the, 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 the heuristics that we have um, uh, derived is to introduce the characteristics and uh, use it as what we call a red line or a current thread throughout the whole school year in variation of context. Keep using the language associated with system thinking. Mm -hmm. And sometimes focus on individual system characteristics to and uh, to deepen the understanding of student, by students of it. So now, a second example, and I see that I'm uh, using up quite a lot of time already. So I'll try to go a bit faster through this one. Uh, project by Susanne Janssen, and she's using looking at models. And let me explain a bit about models. You see on the right hand left hand side you see uh, a model of a heart and you can use that model to understand, for instance, how would the working of this valve in the, in the heart and try to predict what would happen if uh, that valve would not function uh, as it should, for instance. Um, on the right hand, you see a picture that is quite common in school books, at least in the Netherlands. This is about the generation of sperm cells and in, in mammals. And you see how components in the brain, the hypothalamus, through hormones, interacts with, uh, uh, with the various organs. So, um, and one problem is that students see this as a picture and not as a model, uh, because what you see is more a, um, 
a, a representation of the dynamics of a model than, than, than a picture. Um, models like, for instance, a DNA model, um, they are representations of phenomena and systems in biology, but not only biology, they're also used in physics and chemistry, in e economy, in basically any kind of science. And they are, and if you look at it, if you go from Newton's laws to quantum mechanics, basically everything scientists do is a model. Central to, I would claim that central to every kind of understanding is that you have a model of something in your mind, or as a tool that helps you understand what's going on. Uh, also, with the Corona pandemic. Um, we have many people who model the way the, the virus can spread and use those models, for instance, to decide on measures to take, like uh, uh, banning travel and keeping people in their homes. But if, if you then look at the kind of models that are uh, that I showed on the previous slide, and it's, it's also again here, um, we see that they are mainly used as pictures and not really um, uh, representing the dynamics and they, so they can have a, a very clear function in understanding the the, the complexity again of, of biological systems the research of Susanna and Melda are, are very much connected she focused on the individual models Susanna more on the on the global view in, in terms of systems but if you look at this picture you can see that there are certain processes going on uh, hormones being generated in uh, in the brain in the hypothalamus I'm actually not sure if that's an English word. And all kinds of uh, hormones, controlling processes, giving feedback, um, and understanding that kind of dynamics that is very important for, uh, for, for students. So what um, Susanna does is she uses the way, uh, she's looking at the way students understand models. So, uh, and for that, she uses a framework uh, developed by uh, Annette Oetmeijer, Subelsum, and Dirk Kruger. And this is the work of one of their PhD students, uh, Juliana Grunkorn. And um, they are in, in Germany, in, in Berlin, uh, Humboldt University. And they distinguish how you can understand models. You can think about the nature of models, the purpose of models. So nature is what are models really? purpose, why do we use them? Can we have more than one model for the same system? Um, are we, uh, how much can we test models and, and, and how should we change models? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and, and, and all three can be understand, can be understood at, uh, at multiple levels. So, um, um, and, and so this is the framework she uses. And what she done quite similarly to, to Melde, but now with two lessons, she has designed two lessons and developed them again in a team with teachers uh, within a school year. And she was a bit more systematic in also pre and post testing uh, uh, the results and, uh, and the lessons. Um, and one lesson focused really in on a familiar topic on uh, investigating what models are there, um, how can we use those models to serve certain problems uh, and how can we, um, yeah, and how can, can we characterize the models? They, those, those were done in group work. And the second one was really on creating and constructing models. So starting with what we call visual literacy uh, and then converting models to text and from text to models. So, um, so uh, being able to play with the components, being able to construct the kind of diagrams yourself. Two lesson study cycles and a number of measurements in between. So what we uh, what we're very keen on is to have both the theoretical and the practical knowledge uh, that's available, the, the theoretical knowledge from, from the literature, the practical knowledge from, uh, uh, from the teachers involved, and to be able to really study um, uh, the way we can design a lesson and one of the reasons why we use group work well it's quite often good to work in groups groups but it's also meant that the students really had to talk aloud to communicate with each other and we can use that also to get to tap into their thinking 
Um, during the lessons, we had a focus on specific case students. So we, um, uh, we looked at, uh, we, we selected four students and every student was uh, closely observed by one observer. And before that, we predicted how that student would behave. And in the end, we, uh, we, we checked those predictions and using the token behavior and the way and our student work. So I can only go briefly into the results, but in the first lesson, we saw that um, the awareness of multiple kinds of difference between models uh, became clear to students. And uh, they started also to understand that models fit different uh, purposes. And that could, can be illustrated by this, where they had models um, uh, selected on a photosynthesis in this case, and they linked the various purposes that they could select from a, from a larger list to the models. So they could really show, see and show how, um, how the models could be useful for understanding different aspects of the um, uh, of photosynthesis. And also, they, what was also important that they started to understand something about the creation of models that you, um, that you need to link um, uh, the, the, the purpose of the model to the way you um, eventually uh, shape the model. So if you look to the overall results, if you look from beginning to end, they, their understanding of model as, sh as shown on the test increases. They, uh, they are able to reason at more levels of, of students and uh, of model understanding. And also, and that was that's more an informal result, but we had a, did a follow-up study where we had students from this class and compared them to, to students of another class who didn't get those lessons. And we saw that the vocabulary of the uh, students in talking about models really had improved and they, they had may, way more language available to talk and understand about models. And here also the bonus from lesson study was that we gained insight not only in the, in the, um, in, the in the in the uh, in the results of the lesson, but we could follow the whole learning process throughout. And I think that's a very valuable way of, of doing uh, of, of looking at the lessons. And it also mean, meant that we could fine tune the, the, the lesson design uh, a lot. So now I want to return to the question I started in the beginning with some, some general comments. And the question was, what, what can we really know about science education? And what I think that we have learned from, uh, from this experience is that we can see science educational science and science education research, not so much as a, a science that's um, like physics or biology, where we can test something and, and then know something for a fact, but more as a, uh, what we can call engineering science. We know some basic principles about how students learn. We know the domains that we teach, but, um, the, the, we always have to design our lessons and, and teaching experience um, from the bottom, uh, yeah, from the bottom up. Um, and the, the teacher in that sense is basically the final design round. And then um, basically what you always do is de design a lesson for a specific situation where you can use all these basic knowledge that's available. And I like to compare this with an architect who uh, designs a building. There is no single rule for how you design a, a building. There are some principles, there are some things, there, there's some things in, in mechanics uh, and statical mechanics um, that you need to know to be able to, to know that the building is strong enough, that it won't fall, fall down. Uh, there, are, there are rules to take into account. But the aesthetics of the building and the functional uh, way it is designed, the way people like to live or work in a building like that, there are, there are many solutions. And um, I think if we see, start to see educational science as a science of engineering, I think we are way better in understanding what educational science really is and what we can know 
then when we see it as a science with uh, with some kind of truth in, in terms of what works and what doesn't work. And lesson study plays an important role in that because it, it pr can provide a, a very large database uh, repository of examples, case studies um, that we can use to um, as inspiration to design those lessons uh, for, for teachers. Um, and it's always important to, to also to see that the teacher is always the final uh, designer in the chain of design. He uh, Teachers are not robots that can perform a lesson exactly as planned. They need to be able to respond to their, the responses of their, their, their students, for instance. And they also know that in some classes, things may go a bit different than in other classes, and they constantly adapt their lesson design to, to that. So that makes the final point of the puzzle. So I, I like that as a main message for about, uh, uh, about educational science that I think working with lesson study has, um, has taught me about, uh, about science education. So in the end, here are some references. I will make sure that the slides can be shared so you can, uh, you can look up these references. Um, and those are the, the, the articles that are not currently uh, in press or, or published by, uh, by Susanne and, and Melde. And that completes my talk. So thank you very much. And I will be open for question and answer. Okay, thank you, Professor Julian, for your presentation. Before we continue to our Q&A question, I think we have a bit uh, change in our agenda, so we will take the picture first for documentation in this event. Everybody, please uh, turn on your camera first. We will take the picture and then continue to Q&A session. Okay. to Professor Selamat Subiantoro. Okay, we will continue to our Q&A session. I noticed that there was there were two participants that raised hand before when Professor Julian still presenting his slides. Uh, I would like to call Maulana Triangono. Maulana Triangono. Okay, when we Maybe we still cannot connect to him. And the second person is 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 Nudian. Do you still there? Okay, we still don't have any question for Pro Professor Yudingan in chat book too. So first, I want to ask to you, Professor. You told me that the students can name four from seven a concept in the classroom in your slides. Uh, what did teacher do uh, about the three concepts that they missing in that lesson? I, I'm, I'm sorry, that, I don't completely understand the question. There, there are these seven system characteristics. I saw um, in your presentation there were seven. Mm -hmm. Seven system, right? Yes. But in the, uh, uh, I don't remember about uh, what what kind of cycle uh, or what when the teachers uh, teach the system and the student only yeah. can answer on only can find out for system 
uh, and not seven. And what did teacher do? In I, I think I can, can best explain a bit more um, in uh, what, what, what happened in that lesson. Um, the teacher first started introducing uh, system thinking. So uh, she said, um, okay, we, we, we know about cells and, and, and biology, um, but do you realize that, basic, that, that they are all examples of, of systems? So they, it was really introduced as a new topic. And then she would start to talk about an example system, the, the school. So she said, okay, what is a school? What are the components of a school? What goes in and what goes out of the school? And it was a classroom discussion. So uh, students would, um, would answer to the questions like, uh, for instance, what goes in and out. And then, um, well, the, the students come in the morning, they go out in the afternoon. And there was also quite some discussion about what would what really was the system, uh, what is the boundary of the system, and the, and they well they also realized that you can see a school in different ways. You can see it as a school building, but you can also see it as the organization. So um, even the students, um, uh, yeah, even the students uh, while we're discussing about. Um, are you still part of the school when you're not in the school uh, uh, in the evening? Well, if, and if you see the school as an organization, you are. You are a student, even if you're at home uh, at night. So they, um, so they used um, the, uh, the seven system characteristics to, uh, to introduce them all on this example system to school. And on every, she used a PowerPoint for that. And on every PowerPoint slide, mm -hmm. there was this icon that you also saw in the in the tangram, um, and uh, to as a, as a kind of reminder for how the uh, for the system worked. And later on in the lessons, she posted put a poster uh, of the tangram, and and there were different. She, uh, Mel had different versions made uh, with different di different shapes. Um, and every time the, um, the teacher in the follow-up lessons talked about system thinking and system components, she referred to those icons. So, uh, but at the end of the first lesson, uh, students received a worksheet uh, and they, they were asked to explain in their own words what, would, what the system characteristics were. And from that, we saw that for boundary, for input output, for uh, components, they didn't have much trouble explaining what it was. Uh, they could mention all, all seven, although they, they, they did look at the, the, the icons for that. They needed the icons as a reminder. Uh, but for the three hierarchy, uh, dynamics, and feedback, they, were, they had a bit trouble in explaining that. So those three concepts. Uh, were more complex for them. And that's why we paid special attention to them in the second lesson. Yeah, thank you Does for that answer your question? Yeah, thank you for your answer, yeah. uh, Professor. We have two more questions in the chat box. Uh, first from mm -hmm. Bagus Rendi. How, how do students easily memorize the terms in biology lessons? Because there are too many terms and complex in biology. Yeah. That, that's indeed a big problem in biology education. Uh, I recently uh, read the exam terms in the Netherlands for biology, and there I saw that there are about 200 terms that students need to know. So um, that, is, that is really important. Um, I don't have a solution for that. I, I, I do think students are taught too many terms because I think if you think about it, what, what is important about understanding biology, it's not that a certain cell type or hormone has a specific name, uh, but basically how systems like that work. Um, so, uh, yeah, memorizing that, to be honest, I don't really see the use of that, uh, the importance of that. And of course, um, and what you see also see a trend in Dutch exams that 
they are not really asking uh, to to memorize and to um, to reproduce the, those terms, but more uh, the terms are given and they need to be explained what they do. So uh, and that's why also in Dutch exams, especially things like systems thinking, uh, um, are playing a role. For those seven extra terms that we introduce. Um, we have these icons. They they really serve as reminders. They are, are, are a, sl a small pictorial representation of a concept. And every time we use it, we use the picture. So then they are really associated uh, to each other. And uh, yeah, there are too many terms in biology, and, and I think um, we can we we should not try to teach them to remember everything, but really it's better to explain the more general concepts uh, like, okay, what is a hormone? I think that's important to know, but I, I don't think it's important to know the names of every di different kind of hormone. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, Bagus Randy, do you have any further question or is it enough? Uh, Professor Eulingen said that you don't have to uh, to teach your student about the many terms, but you have to find out the main idea about the system and teach them how does it work. Do you have any other question? Or is it enough? Okay, uh, I think it's it's enough. Maybe they will ask later. We will go to the next question from Safina Ade. Uh, mm -hmm. As we know, Professor uh, Julingan, uh, you taught that lesson in the offline class, right? Yeah, this is yeah. all before the, 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 the corona crisis. Yeah. It, um, before the pandemic, but Safina added uh, us yeah. about how can we do it in online class? Do you have any experience about it before? Well, that, that's of course a very general question. Um, uh, all teaching uh, uh, changes a lot due to the, the fact that we all have to do it online now. Um, I, can, I can answer this from two perspectives. The one, uh, one is about teaching biology and system thinking in, um, uh, in an offline situation. I think the role of representations becomes even more important. So using um, diagrams using visual representations of uh, of processes of things like and models. I think both Susanna's work and Melda's work uh, apply to the same uh, thing. There, using concrete visual representations that students can interact with, I think becomes more even more important in an online situation than an offline situation. Um, I have to teach a lot online myself as well and uh, and well you, you see it's 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 difficult so um and the the level of interaction with students is really lower than uh, than what you really want and i don't there are not solutions for everything but like i said uh providing students with tools that they can play around with and discuss uh, on online with each other um I think is important. So using those visual representations, uh, that can be part of the solution. It's not. A, I, I don't claim that I uh, 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 that I know it all. There. Um, the second, but we can also look at the second part, and that's something. Uh, that's the lesson study part. So working together with teachers and teaching and observing online lessons and. For that, with uh, the, the lesson study in El Consortium, we did a uh, an experiment over summer, so when the pandemic has started, and we designed a, a mathematics lesson uh, together with the mathematics teachers um, that we uh, that we did completely online. We did both did the lesson study process online and and the lesson itself, um, and we we saw that there were quite a bit of hiccups in the process that we that you usually don't have when, when doing it live. Um, and the main thing there came down to uh, 
of course, make sure that all the communication tools are in place. And we were experimenting at that time still with, with Zoom, with Microsoft Teams, with other platforms. And I think you all know um, that that sometimes gives trouble. You know, connections can be bad. Uh, people cannot log in or whatever. So that has to be in place. But you have to, sp to put special attention in building trust and mutual understanding. So take the time. In, 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 a, in a lesson study team, but I think it can also apply to a to lesson. Take the time in getting to know each other better, in, um, in, in building trust, in um, being very sure about the conventions that you use for communications, um, things like that. So um, I think um, that's also a, a very important guideline. Uh, don't uh, because we don't have the, the non-verbal communica communication available as usual. Um, you have to make things more ex explicit in the way of, of the, the way you communicate. Okay, Professor, thank you for the for the answer. Safinade, do you want to add something or ask more question? You can unmute yourself. Please show us your face, maybe, and say. Something. Yeah, I think enough. Thank you. <laughs> she doesn't want to uh, to open up the camera. And then we will uh, thank you for your presentation, Professor. I think it's a very great uh, presentation in here because we know how how do you, how do we work to make a better understanding about science and to connect it with our society today? Mm -hmm. Okay, please okay. give big applause Thank for him. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah doing applause is a bit. Uh... No, but uh, thank you. It was a pleasure to uh, to be here, and I, I will stay around for a little while. But at some point, I will have to leave for for a meeting. But uh, um, I was honored to uh, to be, and I hope that we uh, we can stay in touch. Uh, the committee hope you can still stay until the end of the meeting, sir. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm, it's nine thirty, so at least I will mute now and and listen yeah. to the to the other speakers. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, before moving to our second speaker, we will see uh, Universitas Sebelas Maret profile video. Please enjoy. It's time to bring education into the fourth industrial revolution. Flexible, tailor-made curricula are taught by teachers who become mentors to their students giving the workforce of tomorrow the tools to become active lifelong learners, independent problem solvers, and create a diverse and pluralistic society where every person understands and plays to their strengths, building a fair and self-sustaining model for education rather than knowledge. Universidad Sibelis Moret is here to align Education 4.0 with Industry 4.0. Universitas Sibelis Moret was established on March 11, 1976. As one of the most outstanding universities in Indonesia, Universitas Sibelis Moret has noble ideals to develop the country. Universitas Sibelis Moret is located in the suburban area of Surakarta, colloquially known as Solo, a city in central Java, Indonesia. The city is located within a 50-minute flight from Jakarta and one-hour flight from Bali. Solo is well known as a city of culture and the capital of Batik. Universitas Sibelis Moret Surakarta has grown rapidly over the years. It has positioned itself to become the leading institution in Indonesia.
Universidad Sibelis Moret strives to provide high quality education, develop scientific knowledge and technology products at an international level. With its adequate and appropriate learning infrastructure, Universidad Sibelis Moret offers a unique and engaging learning environment and provides integrated IT facilities and information system in a convenient academic atmosphere and green campus area. The library features thousands of books and provides access to a wide variety of international journals which is expected to enhance the learning of the students, faculty, and researchers. In addition to the fundamental concepts and skills required for a successful career, a graduate of the Universita Sibelis Moret is armed with soft skills by taking part in various student activities on campus and student organizations both at national and international level. Students also have the opportunity to acquire global experience through student exchange programs, global internship programs, multilateral research projects, and other international collaborative activities. Universitas Sibelis Moret encourages all researchers to promote their work through publication in national and international journals, as well as other forms of dissemination, such as presentation at national and international scientific forums. Researchers have produced excellent research products and become engaged in the activities of the community through various community service programs. Active partnership and strong collaborations have become inseparable parts of Universita Sabelas Moret, without which progress in education research and community service wouldn't have been achieved. Our international partnerships create ample opportunities for student and staff exchange, research collaboration, and community service. International collaboration helps to give a global perspective on learning in order to address global challenges while still functioning in a national environment based on potential and local wisdom. Universitas Sebelas Maret has three main agendas toward a world-class university. Acceleration and various field of development is needed by embracing the foundation of UNS, Benteng Pancasila. Therefore, five strategic policy pillars were decided. We gladly welcome you to explore and experience our program and to enjoy our campus life which depicts a blend of cultural power, professional life, and technological advance. Universita Sibelis Moret, toward a world-class university. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are already see our profile video. Now we are going to our next speaker. Uh, let me introduce our next speaker. He is Professor Min Suha from Kangwon National University. From Kangwon National University and his latest publication the first one is images of the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide demonstration represented in new media contents 
focusing on simulacra and simulations and simulation. And then the second one is testing validity inference, inferences of science motivation and questionnaire SMQ2 instrument plus based analysis with Indonesian secondary student. The same as Professor Yulingan, Prof. Minsu, you have 45 minutes to present your slides and 15 minutes for Q&A session. This time is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for a uh, great introduction for me. So I'm very honored to be able to uh, present this uh, international webinar. I'm going to share my PPT slide. Yeah, give me a second. So, Okay, uh, can you see uh, my slide? Yes, we can see your Is slide. Is it clear? Yeah, clear. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, so I'm going to uh, introduce uh, the new assessment tool based on the artificial intelligence. Uh, basically, this uh, artificial intelligence system is for the open-ended assessment. So. I'm going to introduce why we have to use open-ended assessment and what is uh, artificial intelligence, how we can use uh, artificial intelligence for the open-ended assessment. Okay, so uh, let me uh, start with the uh, introduction of the artificial intelligence. So it's, it's just the uh, same thing with the computer. So uh, we, every day we use computer and a computer can do so many things for us. So, um, so artificial intelligence is basically you know, the machine uh, which can do uh, many things for the human. And basically, you know, uh, the computer has the CPU and memories and uh, computer, uh, save the knowledge and then they can use the knowledge to make a decision. So, um, so computer can do so many things and we can use computer for the scoring, which is very, very, you know, uh, make us tired, make teacher you know, very tired. So then how, you know, we can, uh, we can use artificial intelligence for the uh, scoring. So uh, in order to understand about that, so we have to understand the principle of the machine learning method. So here is the, uh, the photos of the cat and photos for the, the dog. So, so basically, you know, we, everybody, not, uh, not everybody, but you know, many people can differentiate uh, cat and dogs. Uh, we already learned how to differentiate you know, cat and dog uh, based on the, the shape and uh, of the, the animal. And uh, if we, we want to teach computer uh, how to differentiate cat and dog, we can give the photos, a lot of photos and tell the computer, you know, these are photos of the cat, these are dogs of the, you know, the, uh, photos of dogs. Then computer can uh, find out, you know, the difference between cat and dogs. Maybe, you know, the computer can consider like the shape of eyes or, you know, the shape of the, the head, the shape of the ear. And then, you know, computer make the very good model. And then later, you know, uh, computer can predict whether the animal is cat or animal is dog based on the, the model. So basically, uh, if there is a rule, then the computer can learn. Uh, for example, this is in a uh, automated driving system and driving also based on the, the rule, driving rule. So green light, we can go and in the red light, we, can, we need to stop. And then you know uh, the scoring, like uh, scoring for the open-ended assessment, uh, grading, 
like uh, uh, grading your uh, students midterm and final exam, it should be also the based on the, the rule, scoring rule, which is the scoring rubric. So if there is a scoring rubric and scoring rule, uh, we can teach how to score student response uh, to the computer. So, uh, so basically, this is you know the, uh, my explanation how we how we can teach scoring method to the computer, and so and why uh, today you know we want to use artificial intelligence and we want to use computer to score a student or planned assessment because uh, scoring student response is. Uh, take a lot of time and take a lot of our effort. So, it, and it's not easy. That's why we, uh, we want to use computer. Actually, you know, the, for the multiple choice assessment, uh, we don't really need to use the computer because we have the, uh, like the, uh, what is the OMR, the machine and student, uh, or, you know, not easy, you know, not, very difficult, you know, to score the student, you know, response if we use multiple choice assessment. But you know, the open-ended assessment is very different. And and then I have to uh, talk about why we have to use open-ended assessment, right? This should be the first to explain. Uh, if we can use multiple choice assessment, we don't have to worry about the scoring. Uh, but you know we have to use open-ended assessment. That's why we have to worry about the uh, scoring. So uh, the first of all, using open-ended assessment is strongly related to creative education. So students uh, need to solve a real-world problem, and a real-world problem doesn't have any of the uh, prompt and the options. So in a real world problem, it's not a multiple choice assessment. There is no option uh, for student to select. So basically real world problem uh, is based on open-ended assessment format. And creativity, creative you know, problem solving is also based on you know, open-ended the format. So there is no option uh, for the solution, you know, good solution. So students have to record their knowledge and you know, uh, assemble uh, their knowledge and to make the very good explanation or very good solution for the problem. This is uh, the first step of the creative problem solving. So, uh, so many you know, science educators emphasize the, the importance of the uh, planned assessment of for the creativity, creativity and creative education. And then in you know, the open-ended assessment, uh, is, there are so many in the problem with open-ended assessment. The first uh, is that we cannot give the student the quick feedback or fast feedback or prompt feedback. Uh, so when we receive the student response, at least uh, we need like in you know, several minutes or in you know, like several hours or several days to make the feedback. So if you have only one student, it just uh, it'll take you know five minutes uh, to make the feedback. But if you have the two hundred student, uh, you will uh, need. Like um, at least one day, you know, to make the feedback. And when you give your student the feedback, uh, maybe your student already forget uh, his response and and doesn't have any like a very good like a conflict between student idea and you know scientific idea. So student uh, need fast feedback to make the conflict between student understanding, which are mostly is misconception. And you know, with the you know, scientific concept that uh, they receive from their teacher. So uh, 
for the, the conceptual change model, uh, conceptual change, uh, or for the uh, conceptual conflict, the student really need the fast feedback immediately, you know, they need to receive the feedback from their teachers. So to make the fast feedback, uh, basically you know, it's not impossible to make the fast feedback uh, if the teacher use the open-ended assessment. Uh, this is the first problem. And second problem is, you know, it takes a lot of time and takes a lot of effort. Uh, but, you know, sometimes easy, uh, it, is, it might be easy to solve the problem. If you have uh, many, many uh, like a teaching assistant. So for example, if, uh, if you're uh, the professor and you have the several teaching assistants, like in you know, a seven assistants. And you, know, you can ask the assistant uh, to score the student response. Maybe then you know, it can be um, done, uh, it can be done uh, within several hours. Then you can make the fast feedback. But still, uh, there is a problem. If you have a multiple uh, grader, you have to manage uh, the graders because every grader uh, has different idea about the scoring. So even though you give uh, the same the scoring rubric, every grader has a different idea about the scoring rubric. So basically you cannot make the very generalized uh, the result of the assessment. So if you want to have the generalized result of the scoring, you must have the one assistant or you know all the assistant have to score at the same time. So there are many the problem with the open-ended assessment. But still we have to use the uh, open-ended assessment. Uh, and then I like to talk about the why we need to use the assessment for the our teaching. This is the uh, 5E, the uh, learning cycle model. 70% uh, of the United States textbook are constructed according to the 5E model. So uh, actually this model is developed by the BSCS, the company. And before this model, there were, uh, there were there was you know, 3E model, 4E model. And when they make the 5E model, they added assessment, like the evaluation in the last stage. And they added the engagement, the first stage. Basically, uh, uh, during the, uh, this stage, the teacher need to exam student the preconception, misconception using the diagnostic test. Uh, after class, uh, teacher need to do the formative assessment uh, during the evaluation stage. So first step and last step is assessment. Why? Because in a uh, current uh, science learning is based on constructivism and constructivism is uh, emphasized the uh, student preconception, every class, it should be designed based on student pre-knowledge, misconception, alternative concept. And that's why teacher need to examine student misconception and uh, the alternative concept before the class using the assessment. And then, you know, the teacher teach uh, the student the scientific concept and the uh, when they finish uh, the class, they have to examine uh, student, whether student learn the scientific concept or not using formative assessment. So if student doesn't have the scientific assessment, maybe teacher need to consider uh, the further teaching or in a, uh, the next uh, class, the teacher consider uh, to teach uh, students progressions. So uh, the, these days, 
most or you know almost all in you know, the science teaching should be based on the assessment and diagnostic and cognitive assessment so we uh, every class you know not only uh, the midterm and final exam summative assessment but also uh, the like every every classroom must uh, involve the uh, the assessment, formative assessment. So uh, maybe some of you guys know about uh, this system, clicker. So clicker system is now widely used in the United States uh, large classroom. So students have the remote control, like a very small the remote control. And the teacher uh, showed the question. And then you know, student uh, immediately you know, uh, give the, their answer using the remote control. And the receiver received the student response and analyzed. And very quickly, like within one minute, they show the result. And then student realized you know, they have the right answer or wrong answer. And the teacher give the student and prompt feedback immediately. So the student uh, make the like a, like a conflict. If they have still, they have the wrong knowledge. They have conflict. If student have scientific knowledge, maybe they have the uh, they are very satisfied. So this feedback is very important, and this tool is is um. Uh, these days, you know, many of, there are many applications uh, with the smartphone, but still it's very expensive, the system, uh, but really many uh, the classroom has this system. So why they need to buy this system? Because uh, this just-in-time teaching. So they, uh, they want to have the fast feedback. They have to have this system. So basically, you know, we can see uh, how important the fast feedback is uh, with the, this system. But you know, this clicker system is only based on multiple choice assessment uh, because you know, remote control only they use like this style of the assessment. They can use this system, but they don't have the clicker system using the open-ended assessment. That's why uh, we develop uh, this system is, you know, Evo Grader. Uh, we announced, uh, we developed this system like uh, 2015 when I was a uh, postdoc in the Stony Brook University. And it takes, you know, about four years to develop this system. And still, you know, the project is, you know, uh, Still, you know, they're working on the computer scoring. Uh, so Evo Grader system, you know, as you can see the, the name of the system, this system can grade and can score, analyze the student response about the evolution concept. So, you know, this system cannot score every, you know, the items and only score about the Student response of the natural selection. So with the, this system, for example, at that time we used the, this system for the large class, a large size class, uh, like a 700. So University of Washington, uh, Scott Freeman's classroom, and there are uh, 700 students. And if we use four items. Uh, the number of items are 2,800 response. And the, because you know, the, the class is very big, so there are uh, about like five teaching assistants uh, for grading. But you know, for them, it takes you know, almost one week to finish their grading. But this system can finish uh, within five minutes. Not five seconds, in you know, a still, you know, the computer takes the you know, several minutes. But you know, think about you know, like one week versus five minutes, very big.
big difference, right? So they can use they can use this system in their classroom. For example, so that's how we try this system. So they have the break time. So when the lecturer finished the, the first hour and they show the, this question, then student uh, responds the, their answer using the, their smartphone, whatever. And you know, the teaching assistant just you know, download the student response and upload it, uh, through this system and click. Then in you know, two minutes, they show the result. Then after in you know, a break time, uh, the lecturer see the result and think about you know what's going on. So they believe you know oh the student are learning something. Then just you know move the next class. And if they believe you know the student doesn't uh, do not learn anything, didn't learn anything, then you know they have to uh, like. Uh, return to the like the, the previous you know the, the lecture so this system using this system you know teachers lecturer can use open ended assessment for their classroom and you know the item the name of item is acorns maybe you can search the acorns and my name in the google scholar that you can see the what acorns is this is name of the assessment, open-ended assessment. So we, uh, how we develop the scoring uh, the model. So AI scoring model, you know, uh, we use the machine learning method. So basically the principle of the machine learning method is very simple. So we develop the item and we develop the scoring rubric and we collect the student's pass and we score. So I scored almost you know, 20,000 student's pass. So we have the big data. And then just, you know, we give the, the data to the computer. So computer can just, you know, analyze our scoring, like a human scoring. And they automatically, you know, find out, you know, how humans score this response. And they, you know, make the very good mathematical, you know, equation to predict, you know, the response is correct or response is wrong. That's the, we call it uh, the AI scoring model. Then we can use the model for the uh, future assessment. So basically, you know, uh, to develop the, this system, we have to have the student response, and you know we have uh, we need the data, the scored data. So I scored, and my uh, the, at that time the team scored almost in you know, the twenty thousand student response. So this is actually the problem of the machine learning method, but uh, it takes you know about one year to develop the system. But now still many university and like a million students can use the system. So, you know, it is uh, worth it to try. This is the student response. Think about, you know, how you score these response. And, you know, so one response uh, might have, you know, nine concepts. So you have to score this response using this concept this so you have to think about whether this response has this concept or this concept this concept so you have to see the this response nine times uh, that's why uh, like a normal assistant uh, take four or five minutes to score one response and if they have in you know, a hundred thousand response it's not easy to score. So it's not short answer. It's very like quite long response, and we cannot say it is essay, but you know still very long answers. So that's why we have to have the, such a system. Otherwise, you know we cannot use the open-ended assessment. 
So here is the uh, uh, I, I'm uh, I'm interested in some important project. So AACR project still in a running. They are doing still the same project, and you can search uh, the, their website. I worked for this project. Uh, <clears throat> they you know, have uh, the, the this group has more than ten universities. Uh, why they have so many in the university? You know, it's very simple. So uh, I work for the Stony Brook University in the United States, and my university developed the scoring system for the evolution concept. And MSU developed the Michigan State developed the scoring uh, the system for the photosynthesis, acid base, and you know, uh, the like uh, uh, cell respiration. And you know, other universities develop you know, other concepts. So, uh, and then you know, we combine all together and we will make the, you know, very good, uh, the big you know, the scoring you know, open the, <clears throat> the AI scoring system. So you know, one university cannot cover you know, you know, every concept, the scoring, the system for every scientific concept. That's why you know they have the, such a you know, big team. The Marshall Lin is very uh, the famous and important person in the science education and educational technology. Uh, they did this, this project, class, you know, continuous learning and automated scoring science. Uh, they use the ETS, the company's uh, the scoring model, and they develop the uh, the teaching system. Like the the system give the the assessment to the student and receive the student response and you know analyze the student response and make a feedback. Then student learn something and student uh, make the you know. Uh, the better response and you know, submit and the machine you know, give the, another feedback and student and the student you know, slowly develop their you know, explanation ability. So they test you know, more than 4,000 middle school students uh, whether this system, uh, system is working or not. Then they found you know, most students really like the system and they improve their uh, achievement a lot. So we uh, learn about many things from the this uh, the project. Basically, the computer scoring system is not only for the scoring. You know, when we develop the scoring model, we can use it the computer tutoring system. So computer tutoring system is the next step of the computer scoring. AI scoring project. So uh, that's why uh, the computer scoring the project is very important. So eventually, you know, finally, you know, we want to go to computer scoring the uh, computer tutoring system. So you know, student uh, can learn many things from the computer with the computer's feedback. So uh, computer, in order to make the uh, in order you know, for the computer uh, to make the feedback, computer must know, you know, how to score student response. That's the scoring model. So we have to make the scoring model uh, before we develop the computer tutoring system. So, you know, the Joseph Wilson, the University of Delaware, uh, they conducted, you know, the, this is PS writing system very famous, you know, English grading, you know, English essay grading system. And they use this system uh, to teach the English writing, uh, the elementary school student, and the student really like the system. And they, uh, when they, you know, get the feedback from the machine, and, you know, they're very happy, you know, to make, uh, to communicate the machine and, you know, the, you know, the, the student. So, you know, basically these days, you know, the student like the computer uh, than the teacher actually. So the 
I understand why they are uh, the happier than uh, before. Yeah. Uh, this is the history of the AI in you know, automated scoring. So Alice Page, he is the first person who think about the you know automated computer scoring. That you know the year is 1966. So almost like you know uh, 50 years ago. And ETS, the main the company uh, which lead the computer scoring the research uh, the project. And these days, you know, so many in you know, the country, uh, the China, Taiwan, and Singapore, uh, in, uh, also Korea, and basically you know, uh, English. Uh, the country uh, using English, you know, doesn't have to develop the system because they can just use the the existing system, right? Uh, but if they use the different language, they have to develop their own system. And, you know, if they have the uh, big population, you know, the cost and effect is, you know, uh, is they're more advantageous, right? So, you know, for, for example, in Indonesia have very big populations. So uh, when you develop the computer scoring system, you know you have you know five times bigger user than Korea. So basically, you know, say uh, it will take in the same amount of the budget to develop the system, but you know you have the five times bigger user. You know, uh, you're more advantageous. So how we can use the the system automate scoring? Basically, in a MOOC. You know, these days, you know, because of pandemic, uh, we are more rely on the online learning, right? So, um, so we, so in the MOOC, based on the MOOC, massive online learning, you know, we can use the computer scoring. So easy to manage the student, you know, the progression, student, you know, achievement, you know, using the automated scoring, uh, and the MOOC environment, in, uh, actually, you know, we can take a lot of advantages, you know, from the you know automated scoring system. And customized learning also is important. So student uh, take the uh, the assessment first, and uh, with the computer. So computer examine, you know, what what uh, which part is this student have the weakness. So you know, if computer you know assess uh, uh, and understand you know this student need to study right this part this part, then you know the computer can provide the, the teaching materials for the those subject. So you know, uh, in the the general in the classroom, uh, some students who already know about the, the concept, but they have to study and they have to sit down the classroom. Because, uh, but you know, if the student have the, the computer and the computer can examine the student in you know, the knowledge, so uh, we can make the, the customized education using the you know, automated computer system. And then also active learning is possible. So basically, you know, why uh, the reason why students rely on the teacher uh, is that it's very simple, you know, because students don't know what they don't know. So students cannot examine uh, their like uh, their current knowledge level. That's why they have to rely on teacher and ask teacher, you know, uh, what they study about. But you know, if students can assess their knowledge by themselves, they don't have to rely on the teacher. And this is the first step of the active learning. Also, you know, I talked about creative learning also. So we, you know, student think more and more uh, with the, the computer feedback, you know, we can make, uh, we can become more creative and we can you know, develop the reflective thinking. And also we save a lot of time. Uh, so you know, we can use the time for the more creative education. 
So uh, we, I actually, you know, start this computer scoring. You know, uh, when I was a doctor student, I started uh, the computer scoring the project, uh, and we developed the Evo grade a long time ago. And when I, you know, came to Korea, uh, 2011, uh, 2000, right, 2018, we started uh, the the Y project. So almost finished, you know, this year, you know, now I'm testing version, second version, but, you know, uh, I, I'm going to show the first, uh, the version of the, the system. And I hope, you know, to introduce the, the next version. And actually tomorrow, you know, we will test the, our new version, you know, more complicated version, but uh, basically the, the principle is uh, same. So our system, the name of our system is Y. We name our the uh, the system is you know, Y. This is you know the the web-based automated assessment with artificial intelligence, and uh, you know W A A A I. So Y, and that's why there is this number three, and it's the same from uh, noun station you know with the Y Y question. So our you know, the question is, most of our question is based on why. So this is a you know, QR code and maybe, you know, uh, later you can, you know, this is the recording, right? So you can go to this system and then you can try our system. You can see the feedback. This is question. So students select the question and make the an answer and scoring in you know, a computer make the feedback. And you know, not happy, right? Our robot not happy. So student, you know, answer again. And you know, happy, but still they said not enough. So you know, student, you know, you know, change and revise their answer. And you know, the robot is now happy. So basically, our system, you know, uh, give the feedback to student and help students to develop their explanation in you know, better and better. And you know, through the, this assessment, the students learn how to explain the, uh, the scientific assessment. This is our, you know, the main like, uh, structure of our system, but you know, our version, second version have the more functions and Hope later, you know, I can introduce the, the our second version. So you know, already you know takes the you know more than thirty minutes, <laughs> and it's very fast. You know, the time is so fast. And thank you so much for your you know the attention. Yeah. Okay, Professor Minsuha, thank you for your presentation. Uh, we already know that the first presentation by Professor Yuling Anis about system thinking. And then we have a presentation also about how to assess something, how to assess your student with artificial intelligence with automatic scoring. Okay, we have uh, one question in chat box for you from Agus Wahidi. The question is how to handle and detect the lie respond in your platform with artificial intelligence. Is there any system to avoid students to lie when they are respond, respond to the question? Yeah, uh, let me uh, check the many, you know. So, uh, uh, the Renda. Yeah. So I uh like to uh, say again. So I can I answer uh the you know do we bubbles uh the question or do we bubbles Randy? Yeah. Oh yeah. From Dwi Bagus Randy, is there technology in assessing assessing practicum activity, assessment of student psychomotor activities during practicum? Is there uh, first right. question? Uh, you know, 
So our system is based on the text, right? Uh, activity means like, you know, for example, uh, like the basketball, like the motion, right? So maybe, uh, uh, I don't know actually, uh, but we can develop, you know, someone, you know, <laughs> the AI expert can develop, but I don't know there is, but this day, you know, the motion, yeah, like uh, uh, the imaging, uh, like uh, the, the visual, you know, the analytics is very, uh, very uh, they have very good, you know, technology. So I think, yeah, later, you know, yeah, we can develop, you know, but I don't know, you know, uh, <laughs> we, uh, they have, it's very important, yeah. Yeah, so your project is developing a uh, conceptual assessment uh, assessment system, right? Uh, cognitive yeah, cognitive you know, assessment. And you know, concept, like right? their uh, explanation, you know. Okay, so we still don't have the question, but Professor Minzua agreed that uh, psychomotor assessment is also important and we can uh, develop the system to assess it. Oh, okay, yeah. we <laughs> we have other question from Agus Wahidi. If you uh, you can see it in the chat box, uh, how to handle and detect the lie response from respondent with artificial intelligence? In case of your project, maybe is there any uh, way to detect if somebody is lying about the response? Maybe I uh, I am in the first grade uh, of junior high school, and then I ask somebody to answer my question. Is there any way to detect it. Maybe it's, uh, is it the correct question, Mr. Agus Wahidi? Agus Wahidi Sasrawijaya. Yeah, is it the correct question? Yes, the way right. I interpret it? Yes, this time yeah. it's a little, it's a little that's good. Or maybe you want to ask by yourself to Professor Min Suha, please turn on your camera. I think enough from your fans. No. Okay, Min, so let me uh, yeah. make it clearer for you. <laughs> uh, he asked about uh, how to detect if I lie when I'm uh, answering your question. Maybe when I get the question and then I ask somebody else to answer my question. Is there any system to detect that that, that is not my ability to answer it? Uh, it's, it's not me. It's not me that answering your question. So, it's, you know, the, uh, the question, you, you mean this test question, right? Maybe they're Googling or helped by their parents, people. Yeah, right? yeah, that way. <laughs> you know, that's why we have to change the perception about the assessment. Mm -hmm. So our, you know, assessment is not for the, you know, like the, it's not about the, such a high stake assessment. We all you know, understand assessment is very high stake, like, you know, like midterm, final exam, to make the grade for the competition, right? Mm -hmm. So our, you know, the assessment that I emphasize and, you know, like formative and summative assessment, uh, the formative assessment is not for the grading, like uh, it's not about the credit. So it is for the learning. So if students, you know, Google and find the information and, you know, put the, like the, like cheating, like they are doing, you know, the cheating, you know, or they ask, you know, their friends to answer the response, you know, they don't have to do that because, you know, they don't have any pressure. You know, also teacher need to emphasize this assessment is for your learning. You know, we are not, you know, assessment, um, you know, midterm exam, final exam, like in the college entrance exam, those are, we call it high stake assessment. But, you know, it should be, you know, based on pencil and, you know, paper exam. Right now, you know, we cannot use those in you know, a scoring system. But you know the assessment that I talked about is a formative assessment is for the learning.
So we don't have to worry about it. And also teacher need to teach students, you know, you don't have to do that. You know, I will help you uh, to study your, you know, the science. That's why we do the assessment, you know, uh, don't have to, you know, search the book, <laughs> right? Yeah. That is like, uh, you know, not, you know, good behavior, right? <laughs> so, you know, the, uh, the student also understand why the teacher do the, this assessment. So, you know, formative yeah. assessment, you know, we, the student don't have to do that. <laughs> okay, thank you for the answer, Professor Minsuha. So, uh, the, the main point about the answer is uh, the teacher have to emphasize the student what, what we learn. Uh, what uh, we do in in assess, assessment, informative assessment, right? So the uh, the student don't have to worry about the score, because it is just about to knowing what student already know about the concept, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. For, uh, we have question from Dina Kuswantari. Uh, <coughs> how to apply an assessment appropriately in this pandemic situation? Maybe uh, have you already used your system in real school at Korea during this pandemic? Have you already used your system in Korea during oh, this yeah. pandemic? Uh, the, uh, the previous version, yes, yeah. And also huh. in uh, the last year, not last year, this year, you know, the one city actually asked me, you know, the minister of the education asked me how to use the system because, you know, online learning, teacher wanna <clears throat> give any activity to their mm -hmm. student and they use the, the, uh, the system a lot. And we believe, you know, the many teachers use the system because, you know, basically it's very easy, right? Uh, for teacher, like mm -hmm. the teacher, for example, like the teacher uh, make the assignment. So ask the student, maybe five item, and you finish the, you know, the assessment and print and submit. Then student, right, you have to do that, right? It's very mm -hmm. easy, you know, the assignment management. Okay, thank you for the question. I think the other questions that we find here is the same, the same as the previous questions. So it's already answered by Professor Minsuha. Okay, thank you, Professor Minsuha, for your uh, session. I think it's enough. Uh, okay, yeah. please give him a big applause too. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Professor Minsuha. And then uh, we will have a break. Uh, uh, in this break, we will see a short profile video, two minutes, about science education, Department Universitas 11 Maret.
Okay, we already see the video. Now we will be watching our third speaker here present his slides. Let me introduce first our third speaker. His name is Dr. Sarwanto SPDMSI from Universitas 11 Maret, as we know. Uh, his era, area of expertise is science education. And this topic is about optimizing science skill process on online learning. And Dr. Sarwanto, you have 45 minutes to deliver your slides. Time is yours. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, can I have to share my presentation? You can share it right now. Okay, okay thank you. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, Good evening, good evening for Mr. Min Suha. Good morning for Mr. Tulingan. Uh, uh, Mr. Sarwinda, Mr. Sarwinda, uh, can I just yeah. wait for 10 minutes because it's, <laughs> it's come to evening. Okay. Okay. Uh, 10 uh, minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. <clears throat> I will present in two language. Uh, Maybe in English, maybe in Indonesian, because uh, uh, maybe uh, our uh, my presentation is not too clear if to if uh, I ask in English. I am I will present my experience. Maybe not uh, my. Uh, result of my research or the theoretical studies, but it is only my uh, experience about optimizing students' science process skill in online classroom. This time is uh, COVID-19 pandemic. As a COVID pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, e-learning is one of the most, uh, uh, one of uh, media to learn to, to my uh, student. Because in online classroom or e-learning before COVID-19 pandemic, uh, few are interested in my university, in uh, university, uh, not more 20% uh, lectures use e-learning to, uh, to learn to my students. Yeah. But as long as uh, COVID-19 pandemic, all teachers use e-learning. E-learning before COVID as a complement of learning, but after uh, or as long as the pandemic, e-learning the main media of learning. Before pandemic, e-learning to accommodate material and assignment only, but as long as this pandemic, e-learning or online classroom uh, place to do the learning process. Yeah. E-learning probably used for experiment because the experiment uh, do in the real laboratory. But because the laboratory is closed, so e-learning already used for experiment. We know this is called virtual laboratory. And an assessment before COVID-19 pandemic, classroom assessment to assess learning activity, 
But as long as the pandemic, assessment piece on virtual classroom learning activity. This is the facts uh, about before pandemic and as long as uh, pandemic uh, like this. To, opt up to optimize uh, my lesson uh, in the uh, online learning on online classroom, Lesson plan, plan before lecture as implement of the curriculum. And e-learning is planned before to lecture. Because uh, if it's not planned before uh, the lecture, uh, the e-learning uh, only for complement uh, in the uh, learning. And the second learning outcome consists of attitude, knowledge, and skill. Yeah. This is the same as in, in, an, uh, in a real classroom, but in the e-learning or in the uh, online learning, attitude, knowledge, and skill we can uh, lecture, uh, we can study to our children. And the lesson plan is prepared before uh, we design the lesson plan, we prepare learning resources. The second, we uh, prepare the learning activity. And the last, we prepare the assessment. What is the assessment in an uh, e-learning or in, in the online uh, classroom? Doing in the classroom, uh, as long as doing in the classroom in or in online classroom, we mix a synchronous and asynchronous to learning uh, my material to the student. Asynchronous learning is doing before and after college, but uh, in uh, time of synchronous learning is face-to-face -face and in virtual classroom. We use video conference uh, to open the class, explain the target of the lecture, classifying assessment that can be done in a pre-lecture, student presentation, providing re reinforcement and closing lectures. If we have uh, one hour to uh, my lesson, the video conference only 20 uh, to 20, 20 to 30% of our time. Chat or discuss is to doing activities like discuss, uh, reporting observation, writing data, analyzing data, and make conclusion. This is a uh, the student do in a chat or discussion in the e-learning uh, classroom or in the learning management system, LMS. After lecturing, post the lecturing, the student do a report. And sometimes they doing independent or structural assignment. Yeah. Uh, and in the four or uh, three time uh, we do an assessment to my student. This is e-learning in ONS or ONS e-learning called SPADA. My lecture, sometimes like this, this is uh, my lecture in physics, this is in uh, science education. Uh, we will uh, I will to uh, prepare about my experience 
about subjek mekanika Newton, Frida dan Kalor, or uh, Newton mechanics, fluid and heat. Uh, the activity and resources about uh, my uh, lecture is Simon Big Blue Button. This is a video conference chat. This is a synchronous uh, chat forum. This is a synchronous uh, chat. Uh, it's 5P or ETML, uh, 5P and quiz. This is uh, the activity in the uh, online classroom. And resources is a file, film or video, etc. This is my uh, subject about mekanika Newton, fluida and color. The first, uh, before I uh, learn to my student, we introduce about who is uh, the lecturer. And then after uh, student uh, learning, uh, uh, introduce the, this uh, lecture and then the student study about uh, the preface yeah. and what is the learning outcome student will be know about the learning outcome because this is uh, the important to uh, uh, curriculum about uh, the subjects is an implementation of a uh, program study curriculum. And then uh, student uh, can know about what is the content or table of, this is a table of content in, in my e-learning. After uh, the, the student uh, study about uh, or read about uh, content of our uh, lesson yeah it's a time the uh, lecturer the student study pre lecturer like this this is a uh, student uh, do the assignment before a lecturer this is uh, the time about one hour in one uh, SKS or one unit. If this uh, subject have four unit or four SKS, the student do this, uh, doing this assignment about four hour. So in the class or in online learning on in our online classroom, they study with uh, me I uh, lecture about this is uh, work and energy for uh, for hours, and then uh, in this uh, time I uh, video conference about one hours to my children, and then after it they uh, can discuss or doing the uh, doing the problem in uh, in uh, uh, books or in uh, textbooks. After the, the student studying with me, uh, or uh, they study about, uh, uh, like it, uh, work and energy, yeah. I give him uh, an assignment. Uh, this is assignment after uh, study in uh, 26 October. This is uh, for about uh, five days to do uh, their assignment. This is uh, this assignment about four hours to yeah. if my uh, subject have uh, for SKS or for unit. Sometime uh, I give them an experiment, yeah. a virtual experiment like this. This is an experiment, yeah. a virtual experiment from Pet Colorado. Yeah. 
physics education uh, experiment from Pet Colorado. I give him, uh, give them to design uh, an experiment to design what is the variable and uh, doing the experiment to uh, explain the variable, to test the variable, and then uh, to make conclusion. Mm -hmm. This is uh, from this experiment, the student can do about science a process scale. After they do uh, this experiment, they uh, get a uh, pre-report uh, as long as they uh, doing an experiment. After uh, doing an experiment, they study more than one subject. In the uh, how to manage subject. They doing an, a final report like this. This is uh, my student collect uh, their reports. Uh, I will give one student. Uh, this is uh, one student. Uh, this is the Mutia uh, Fabri. Uh, they have three uh, Simon. Yeah. Uh, one is report, and this is the pre report, and this is uh, uh, doing the problem solving in uh, uh, textbooks. To know, uh, to uh, to try to train uh, an science process skill. Yeah, this is the uh, my student, Dia uh, Motia Febri report, pre report. We doing what is the variable, uh, independent variable, and dependent variable, and the control variable. This is a uh, Good, very good uh, experiment. Yeah. And then uh, from this uh, table, we do uh, a grab, yeah. a piece, a grab with uh, an Excel. This is the first experiment, and this is the second experiment. And then after the uh, doing the pre experiment, we get them. Uh, we get them about uh, through or three days to make a final report. This is the final report. Uh, about experiment uh, second Newton law. Yeah. And interesting about uh, the Amutia report. This is uh, their report. One is uh, introduction, and then this is a um, uh, <clears throat> problem, and he give an hypothesis, and then this is uh, the target of uh, experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, she is uh, doing the theory, uh, the theory about uh, Newton law uh, from. The theory they doing a practicum or in the experiment. They do experiment in their uh, room. This is a uh, 14 October uh, 2020. This is the first uh, experiment. Uh, he is doing about uh, moving, how to move uh, acceleration. And then uh, they uh, get a table, and then they uh, communication the table in the crab. This is the crab, and then this is in the second experiment. Yeah, about uh, force and acceleration. She get uh, a mass uh, constant variable. Yeah, this is. The third experiment, they have uh, this is a uh, mass as uh, independent variable and then uh, acceleration as uh, dependent variable. This is the result. 
and discuss ya yeah. this is a result discuss it is a very very good uh, the dis, uh, discuss but uh, she uh, not get an uh, grab from this grab uh, get an, uh, equation but if uh, the uh, if she get an equation it is uh, very good yeah very good this is uh, my student experiment uh, and the, from uh, they are doing yeah. we get uh, science process scale we can know uh, who is uh, c to their uh, cis uh, science process scale and this is the conclusion from the uh, her experiment uh, this is a uh, and science process skill, uh, science process skill from uh, my student. Okay, and then uh, from the uh, from my lecture, uh, we have an experience. The first optimization of science process skill in online learning. First lesson plan as a design as an implementation the curriculum document preparing the learning resources and activities before uploading them to e-learning students are given the opportunity to learn before entering in online class uh, we give them uh, some uh, uh, some assignment or uh, uh, another Synchronous meeting beside building knowledge. Uh, they also train the scale uh, like science process scale. Science process scale can be trained to students through virtual laboratories like the uh, DEA uh, report. After the lesson, they, uh, they, keep on, uh, they were given the assignment to make report and do the homework. Thank you. This is uh, my presentation about my experience about optimizing the lesson in online learning uh, in my subject or uh, my lecture. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, Dr. Sarwanto, we have two participants that raise their hand. The first participant is Mr. Saulim de Tehuta HN. Please turn on your camera and ask directly to, to Dr. Sarwanto. Mr. Saulim? Hmm? You can speak in Indonesia? In Bahasa? Okay, if we don't if he's not with us again, we will ask the second person. He is Agus Wahidi Sasrawijaya. Please turn on your camera and ask to Dr. Sarwanto. You can ask your question in chat box. In Indonesia. Uh, in Indonesia. In Indonesia. Okay, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Agus Wahidi. Agus Wahidi, your your uh, mix uh, is unmute. You can unmute yourself Just right unmute, now. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay, okay. Thank okay. you. Okay, okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Pak Sarwanto. Waalaikumsalam. Assalamualaikum. Yeah. Waalaikumsalam uh, warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Iya. Yeah. Yeah. Jumpa lagi Pak Sarwanto. Iya, nah, terima kasih. Ini Pak Sarwanto. Salam ke Kalimantan ya. Ya Pak. <laughs> ah, ini Pak pengalaman kami juga di Alening itu banyak keluhan dari orang tua siswa bahwa eh, mereka dibebani banyak tugas oleh beberapa mata pelajaran. Ah, mungkin kalau di kuliah kan hanya beberapa mata kuliah, tapi kalau di sekolah itu kadang sampai 14 eh, mata pelajaran dalam satu minggu ada assignment semua, ada tas tas semua. Terus bagaimana memanage e-learning ini, Pak? Apakah digilir setiap minggu siapa yang ngasih tugas atau ada semacam uh, penugasan secara tematik sehingga berkolaborasi antara mata pelajaran itu, Pak? Thank you, Pak. Itu untuk pertanyaan, Pak. Oke, 
ya. Makasih Pak. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Langsung ini Bu Sarwinda. Ya Pak, I can answer the question directly. Oke, oke. Baik. Terima kasih uh, Mas Agus Wahidi ya. Memang ada perbedaan karakter uh, antara pendidikan dasar dan menengah dengan pendidikan tinggi khususnya atau berkaitan dengan kemandirian belajar kaitannya dengan kemandirian belajar. Memang kalau di pendidikan tinggi itu kan kita sudah memiliki image bahwa ya mahasiswa kita adalah orang dewasa karena dilihat dari usianya dan perkembangan psikologisnya sudah masuk golongan orang dewasa sehingga tadi belajar itu adalah tugas mereka, jadi itu menjadi sebuah kesadaran bagi mahasiswa dan saya merasakan eh, mahasiswa itu kalau yang sekarang ini dengan pembelajaran online ini ya kalau saya rasakan ya dibanding dengan pembelajaran waktu luring di kelas itu jauh lebih dewasa yang ini karena kalau e, secara luring itu pengalaman dari tahun-tahun sebelumnya ketika diberi tugas begitu kemudian diminta untuk mengumpulkan itu kadang-kadang malah susah sekali. Hmm. Tapi kalau yang sekarang pakai e-learning itu malah mahasiswa itu lebih sering ngejar-ngejar e, kok ini belum ada tugas Pak. Nah itu kan ya, <laughs> menurut saya kok menarik ini kalau kalau di mahasiswa ya. Dan yang lebih penting lagi adalah di awal pertemuan, di awal pembelajaran itu kita tekankan tentang standar proses pembelajaran. Karena seringkali pergantian dari atau e, perpindahan dari masa studi di pendidikan dasar menengah di SMA, kemudian ke perguruan tinggi, dia kan belum kenal bagaimana proses belajar di perguruan tinggi. Makanya kita kenalkan tentang standar proses pembelajaran bahwa yang namanya satu SKS, itu waktu belajarnya mahasiswa itu 170 menit. Bertemu dengan Bapak Ibu dosen memang hanya 50 menit, sedangkan yang 2 jam yang karena satu SKS 170 menit, yang 2 jam satu jam pertama itu sebelum kuliah dan satu jam kedua itu adalah tugas setelah kuliah. Kalau 4 SKS ya tinggal mengalihkan saja. Ini ini penting untuk yang untuk mahasiswa ya, yang mahasiswa itu e, begitu, e, itu cukup penting bagi mahasiswa dikenalkan dari awal. Dengan demikian ketika kita mahasiswa itu mengambil berapa SKS, 20 SKS, konsekuensinya ya kita kita mereka diminta menghitung sendiri. Nah ini, ini pengalaman. Kemudian yang kedua, kalau yang di tingkat pendidikan dasar dan menengah ini harus dilihat e, apa namanya, psikologis ya, ya betul, psikologis dan kesiapan belajar memang untuk pendidikan dasar dan menengah ini lebih banyak bimbingan yang harus diberikan kepada siswa sehingga betul tadi apa yang disampaikan atau usulan dari Mas Agus Wahidi tadi bahwa kita harus bisa mengatur pandai-pandainya untuk mengatur beban belajar mereka karena waktu mereka untuk belajar itu kan harus ada juga untuk waktu bagi mereka untuk bermain dan bersosialisasi. Ataupun kalau kita lihat dari pembelajaran ya, dari desain pembelajaran itu bahwa di tingkat pendidikan dasar di SD itu kan lebih banyak eh, ke eh, apa namanya sikap ya, asyidut. Makanya kalau di pendidikan dasar dan menengah itu asyidut atau sikap itu dibagi dua yaitu sikap sosial, sikap religius. Kalau kita lihat dari grafiknya pun eh, yang sikap tadi lebih luas daripada pengetahuan dan keterampilan. Sedangkan dari di perguruan tinggi memang sikap itu sudah ya harapannya itu sudah sudah terbawa dari pendidikan dasar. Yang lebih besar itu adalah pada keterampilan. Makanya kalau di pendidikan tinggi yang diperbesar itu adalah keterampilan umum dan keterampilan khususnya ya, gitu. Itu bedanya di situ. Oleh karena itu, porsi untuk membangun sikap ini betul harus diberikan kepada siswa kita sehingga ya beda antara pendidikan dasar dan pendidikan dasar menengah dengan di pendidikan tinggi ya itu masalah itu jadi setuju sekali jadi memang harus harus diatur ya porsi kapan dia bermain porsi kapan dia belajar karena pengetahuan kalau di pendidikan dasar dan menengah itu mestinya jangan terlalu atau belum terlalu 
kuat, belum terlalu banyak, belum terlalu uh, dibebani dengan konten yang berat, tetapi lebih kepada membangun karakter, membangun sikap. Itulah perlu waktu itu tadi, betul. Ya. Saya setuju, ya. Gitu, ya. Terima kasih. Ya. Saya kembalikan pada uh, Mbak Febri, ya. Mbak Sarwenda. Okay, thank you for the answer, uh, Dr. Sarwanto. And we have one more question from Mr. Agus Ramdhani. Please turn on your camera, please. Okay. Yes, thank you, Mbak Sarwenda. Assalamualaikum, Pak Sarwanto. Waalaikumsalam. Ini yeah, Pak Agus Ramdhani from Lombok. Uh, yeah, greetings. Greetings from University. Lombok. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Pak Sarwanto. Senang bisa silaturahim lagi di ya yeah. yeah, I'm, I'm very happy for the sharing of interesting experience yeah. regarding teaching and learning during pandemic era yeah. ya. Tapi saya akan tadi sudah banyak menjelaskan. Mungkin kita juga di Matara mengalami hal yang sama gitu. Ini bisa join research nanti melakukan hal ini. Ma pertanyaan saya ini ya mungkin agak keluar sedikit. Sekarang penelitian-penelitian di S1 IPA maupun di S2 IPA itu bagaimana menyikapinya dengan kondisi seperti ini? Mungkin bisa cerita pengalaman juga Pak Sarwanto terkait hal ini untuk skripsi dan tesisnya ya. mahasiswa. Terima kasih. Ya. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh ya. Uh... Terima kasih Pak Agus Ramdhani, Pak Dr. Agus Ramdhani. Salam untuk teman-teman dari e, Mataram. Ya. Terima kasih atas kehadirannya di webinar e, pada sore hari ini. E, sharing saja pengalaman dari UNS ya, berkaitan dengan skripsinya mahasiswa. Memang ada beberapa kelompok atau ada, ada beberapa klasifikasi untuk e, penelitian penyelesaian skripsi mahasiswa karena pada masa pandemi ini jelas mereka tidak bisa hadir di kelas secara luring ya maka beberapa eh, kelompok ya berapa jadi diklasifikasi klasifikasikan begitu Pak Agus diantaranya ada yang kelompok-kelompok eh, mengembangkan atau menyusun instrumen assessment kemudian juga ada yang mengembangkan eh, pembelajaran atau modul-modul pembelajaran khususnya e-learning ada juga yang melakukan pembelajaran e-learning ya, melakukan pembelajaran e-learning ada yang e, pembuatan ininya Google Classroom-nya ya. bahkan ada juga yang mengikuti atau kalau seperti tadi e, e, Mr. Jolingen tadi tentang apa tuh uh, lesson study ya mengikuti pembelajaran yang dilakukan oleh guru di uh, Google Classroom kemudian mengamati bagaimana siswa belajar di dalam uh, Google Classroom tadi jadi itu yang bisa dilakukan oleh mahasiswa jadi mahasiswa tetap tidak terganggu dalam proses penyelesaian studinya uh, karena kendala tidak bisa uh, hadir di sekolah jadi bisa pada tarap penyusunan atau mini pengembangan atau pengembangan yang masih tahap-tahap awal tidak sampai pada implementasi tetapi hanya sampai pada, pada tahap validasi mungkin juga ada yang sampai pada uji coba kecil untuk kelompok-kelompok karena mungkin di kampungnya itu ada kelompok-kelompok siswa yang belajar secara online atau belajar kelompok di kampungnya maka bisa diuji cobakan di kelompok uh, uji coba kecil di kelompok kelompoknya ini uh, yang di yang kita lakukan di UNS itu uh, seperti itu uh, Pak Agus ya. itu Pak Agus ya. terima kasih ya, terima kasih ya. terima kasih salam ya, thank you. Ya. Okay, thank you. Uh, that one is our last question for this session. So we already listen three of our speakers presenting their slides today. And please give big applause to, to Dr. Sarwan. Now before closing this session, uh, I would like to ask Minsu, uh, Professor Minsu and Dr. Sarwanto to give closing statement. Maybe you can uh, start from Profesor Minsu. 
Yeah, uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me for international webinar. And you know, actually, in you know, the last year and in you know, years ago, I visited Indonesia you know, for more than five times a year. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, this year, and you know, uh, I'm not able to uh, uh, visit Indonesia. And I'm very, you know, I meet you know many in my Indonesian friends, and I hope you know in the pandemic. This pandemic is uh, uh, closing, you know, like a finish, you know, like uh, very soon, you know, and you know can visit Indonesia again. And but you know it's very good, right, to like uh, make uh, such a like uh, the collaboration with uh, through the internet. And I think uh, you know, and now I realize you know it's very easy to you know to share the knowledge and many things uh, through the you know, internet. And so maybe you know, um, we can do more in the collaboration, you know, uh, yeah, uh, from this in the webinar. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Professor Minsu. <coughs> and next, uh, Dr. Sarwanto, you can uh, speak in Bahasa or in English. Okay, yeah. It, uh, thank you uh, to Mr. Sarwinda, <coughs> Ms. Sarwinda. I'm sorry, yeah. Terima kasih uh, Mbak Sarwenda ya, yang sudah memberikan waktu pada saya untuk memberikan statement uh, untuk ini. Yang pertama saya ucapkan terima kasih kepada Prodi Pendidikan IPA S1 yang sudah memberikan waktu pada saya untuk sharing pengalaman. Juga uh, thank you for uh, Mr. Minsuha. I have uh, uh, I have an experience about uh, assessment, ya. Yeah. Uh, artificial assessment, uh, thank you, and uh, dan terima kasih juga pada semua pihak yang telah uh, menyelenggarakan kegiatan pada uh, hari ini. Kemudian mudah-mudahan sharing pengalaman tadi bahwa meskipun uh, kita di masa pandemi, uh, we in pandemi area, uh, kita bis tetap bisa melaksanakan pembelajaran dengan penekanan kepada science process skill ya penekanan pada keterampilan proses lain tetap bisa terlaksana karena bagaimanapun juga kita memiliki uh, sarana dan prasarana hanya uh, kita memang perlu uh, mengadaptasikan dari pembelajaran luring ke pembelajaran uh, e-learning atau online learning gitu terima kasih assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Before closing the session, uh, the committee already uh, prepared the certificate certificate of appreciation for our speakers. We can see it together right now. Okay, we already see the certificate, and now um, I would like to remind, remind you that all of the participants, uh, if you want to get the certificate, you have to fill the link that already shared in the box, chat box, and then all of the slides from the speakers will be upla uploaded in uh, Pendidikan IPA, FKIPUNS uh, website. It is https ipa.fkip.uns.ac.id. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I am Febriani Sarwenda, the moderator of this session. Uh, plus this session. Thank you for the time. Uh, time is yours, Miss Meta. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please give a fearful appreciation for our speakers and our moderator. We would like to extend our highest respect and gratitude to our remarkable speakers. Thanks to our speakers for a very insightful lecture and all of you the value and benefits from the lecture. Also, thanks to our moderator.
for leading the presentation of each speaker. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to have a very special session. This is a keyboard session for all of the participants in this webinar today. As almost certainly, with a very special prize awaits. The clues for the lucky winner for today is a letter from the participant who have asked question to the three main speakers of this webinar and also the first registrant of this webinar. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's advance to the announcement of the giveaway winner's name. The winners are number one. Uh, the number is Bagus Rembi. Number two is Shafina Ade. Uh, number two is the special prize. Belongs to the Dwi Bagus Rembi. Number four is Agus Wandi. The winner is Dina Kusmantari. Mercedes Baik Fatmawari. The next winner is Normalita Amanda. And finally, Agus Ramden. Congratulations for the lucky names today. We hope you enjoy the prize and kindly to check your email. And to the other participants who haven't won the giveaway, don't be sad, don't be so gloomy, as the Science Education Department of the University of Basmara still has many more webinars and events to go. So it's best to stay tuned and prepare yourself for the next event. Well, ladies and gentlemen, finally we come to the end of this event. Before we end our webinar, let us take a picture first. So please prepare your best smile and kindly turn on your camera for a moment as we will have a photo session. Please to all participants, turn on your camera. And that's it. I'll say it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for it very much for your attendance and your nice attention. It was a pleasure for us to be in a forum with so many inspired people and a very enthusiastic participant for today's webinar. We do hope that this webinar will give us memorable and insightful lesson to all of us. Hope you are staying safe and healthy. And we all can meet again for the pandemic end. I'm Ahmed Abin. And I'm Meta Olya. Respectfully signing out. Good evening and see you later. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Prof. Minto. Thank you, Pak Sarwanto. <laughs> Terima kasih, Bapak Ibu, Ibu yang lain.